Welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell. This podcast features in-depth explorations into the traditions of yoga, Sanskrit, Indian philosophy, and South Asian religions. Through candid conversations with scholars and practitioners, you will immerse in the latest and most cutting-edge research on all things yoga. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 9 of the Yogic Studies Podcast. In today's episode, we'll be speaking with Dr. Jason Birch from SOAS, University of London. Jason and I had a wide-ranging conversation on all things yoga, from the Rishikesh yoga scene in the early 2000s, manuscript hunting in India, the history of asana, and so much more. Jason's work along with that of Dr. James Mallinson, who I interviewed in a previous episode, has been particularly influential on my own academic trajectory. And so it was a special opportunity to get to sit down with him for this slightly more formal chat and to learn more about Jason's story. Apologies in advance that this episode is slightly longer than usual, but once Jason and I get going about medieval yoga, it's pretty hard to stop. Dr. Jason Birch is a postdoctoral research fellow at SOAS, University of London. After completing a first-class honors degree in Sanskrit and Hindi at the University of Sydney under Dr. Peter Oldmeadow, Jason was awarded a Clarendon scholarship to undertake a DPhil in Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford under the supervision of Professor Alexis Sanderson. His dissertation, which was submitted in 2013, focused on the earliest known Raja Yoga text called the Amanaska, and included a critical edition and annotated translation of this Sanskrit work, along with a monographic introduction. Jason is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at SOAS, working on the Hatha Yoga Project, a five-year ERC-funded project, which is now in the final year of completion. His particular area of research for the project is the history of physical yoga on the eve of colonialism. Jason is currently editing and translating six principal texts on Hatha and Raja Yoga, which will soon be available for publication. He also collaborates with Jacqueline Hargreaves on The Luminescent, an online hub for sharing yoga research. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Jason Birch. All right, I'm here with uh, Jason Birch. Jason, welcome to the Yogic Studies podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Well, thanks for the invitation. Yeah. How are you doing? Uh, how's your quarantine uh, time, I know, it is a very strange time for everyone, uh, but, but how are things going for you? And and where are you right now? Uh, we're living at our um, in North Oxfordshire in a in a barn that we rented at the beginning of the year, and we're very fortunate to be here because uh, we have access to country walks, and we're a little bit isolated from the large towns that have experienced problems with. Uh, with the virus. So we've been in a good situation and it's been a productive time. A lot of academic events have been cancelled uh, over the summer. So it's enabled us to write mm. and just at the right time because the project ends on the 30th of September and we really should be focusing on finalising the outputs. And I think if the lockdown hadn't occurred, we would not have made as uh, as much progress as we have in in that regard. So, for us, it's 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 been beneficial in some ways. Yeah, a sort of forced writers' retreat, perhaps. Yes, and and in hindsight, that's what we should have planned to do, whether there was a lockdown or not. Um, we, I think, we said last year that we should um, cancel any commitments and leave our calendars free for writing. But when you get invited to various events and conferences, uh, it can be hard to say no. So that didn't happen until the lockdown occurred and then those events were canceled. And we ended up having a writer's retreat. 
Okay. Yeah, and you mentioned that you're you're nearing the end of this five year Hatha Yoga project. Publications and critical editions deadlines are starting to appear, and I want to discuss all of that and your your fantastic contributions uh, to this project and to get into your your really pioneering research on Hatha and Raja Yoga, the history of Asana, and and so much more. Um, but before we get into all of that, you know, one of the things um, I'm aiming to do on this podcast is to also learn a little bit about the stories and biographies of these yoga scholars and to learn a little bit from you today, Jason, uh, about, you know, how you came to do this work. How did you become a Sanskritist um, to working on this uh, Hatha Yoga project? How, how did you get into yoga? And then how did that you know, um, bring you into academia? Mm. Well, it, now that I look back, it seemed to happen by chance in many respects. I was studying classics at Sydney University as an undergraduate student and enjoying it very much. I was mainly studying Latin and Roman history. And one of my Latin teachers would often talk about Sanskrit, particularly the cognate words that Sanskrit uh, Latin and Greek have similarities in their declensions and conjugations. And at the same time, I was reading a lot of English li literature as well as philosophy. And I think it was probably the comments of my Latin teacher that uh, uh, piqued my interest in uh, German philosophers and what they had to say about Sanskrit, particularly Schopenhauer. Mm. Um, as well as uh, um, Indian religions more broadly. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's um, comments about Buddhism were uh, uh, always very interesting, particularly in light of his critique of Christianity. Uh, and at the same time, I also remember the, uh, the work of American transcendentalists like uh, Emerson and uh, Thoreau, their, their uh, admiration for the Bhagavad Gita and mm -hmm. so forth. And I think I was also, uh, after, the, after studying classics for a year, uh, st starting to wonder how long I wanted to do it for. Uh, as uh, you might know, with uh, many of the great works uh, of the classics, they've been fairly well studied. There's uh, usually several editions, uh, many, many books about them. And scholarship in that area is often... Um, is often required to assess past scholarship and then find a new angle to study. And, uh, and even though I, I hadn't uh, uh, discounted, um, I suppose, the possibility of pursuing it much further, I, I, I again, by chance met the Sanskrit teacher at Sydney University. Uh, we hit it off. This was uh, Dr. Peter Oldmeadow. His area of specialty was Mahayana Buddhism. Mm. And after talking and, 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 and going to a few of Peter's classes, I, I realized that there was a world that I, that I really hadn't, didn't know much about, hadn't been exposed to beyond perhaps my own private reading, and that there was a lot to, uh, of new material to learn and study. And, and so um, by the end of the first year of my BA, I transferred to Indian studies, from classics to Indian studies, majoring in Hindi and Sanskrit. Mm. And I think by the end of my BA, it was clear to me that uh, there was a lot of research uh, that one could do in the area. There were many um, texts hadn't been properly studied um, and many manuscripts um, uh, really hadn't been looked at for various works. I suppose at the same time, again, it was in the first year of my BA, my health was not so good. I'd been a chronic asthmatic since a, um, quite a young age. Throughout my teenage years, I'd been on medication for that. And then when I was in my early 20s, um, my asthma was basically worsening and the, the medication uh, wasn't working. So friends advised various things. Swimming uh, was one I remember. Uh, 
but I didn't like the cold water. And, uh, and then someone suggested yoga. Mm -hmm. So again, this was in the first year of my study of Sanskrit. I tried a yoga class. I happened to find a very good teacher early on, which I think made a big difference. And after a year of doing yoga, I was pretty much free of medication uh, for my asthma. Mm, wow. And more than that, I suppose my quality of life, particularly um, my energy levels, um, clarity of mind and so forth, were uh, significantly improved. So it, 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 uh, uh, it gave me great um, uh, encouragement, I suppose, to, to pursue the practice uh, for, for that reason. And then, of course, by the end by the end of the year, I was starting to study Sanskrit, uh, Indian history, and then, of course, took an interest in yoga texts. And it was probably by the end of my undergraduate degree that I realized that I could do um, further research in, in the history of yoga. Wow, that's quite interesting um, in what would come for you, I think, you know, knowing now you know, the area of your research on physical Hatha yoga and looking even at the confluence and parallels with Hatha yoga and Ayurveda, classical Indian medicine, looking at some of these texts on medieval Hatha yoga that prescribe particular asanas to uh, eradicate particular diseases and ailments in the body. It's quite interesting that your beginnings of entering into a yoga practice and then leading you to study these yoga texts sort of began with your own um, asthma and wanting to remedy and treat that through a yoga practice. Yes, I, I think I was also very lucky that the, the yoga scene in uh, Sydney was very rich. Um, uh, as I said, I found a, a very good teacher. He was, uh, his name was uh, Simon Borg Olivia. He was an, an amazing inspiration in the, in the beginning. He, was, he had buckets and buckets of energy and gave 100% of himself to his teaching and practice. And it was really a great inspiration to, to study with him. Sydney had a very large theosophical um, bookstore in, in the heart of the city that had all sorts of fascinating uh, books on the shelves, uh, in, including, of course, the old uh, theosophical publications of Vivekananda, Vivekananda and Annie Besant, mm -hmm. and so forth. And I remember looking through them when I started the practice of yoga and, and uh, the study of Sanskrit. And they, they just seemed so, uh, so different, uh, so unusual. There was, there was so much of what I read seemed, um, seemed difficult to penetrate that um, the meaning and, and uh, the reasons for um, uh, for the content mm -hmm. eluded me completely. And I remember reading the Hatha Pradipika at a fairly early stage and even trying to read parts of it in Sanskrit. And I really got so very little out of it. I, I sort of, um, it was again, almost impenetrable in many respects. Mm. And that has, that sort of egg, egged me on over, over the years to, to keep trying to answer the questions that, um, that these texts and the history and the publications have continually um, raised. Uh, and it's, I suppose, I've managed to answer some of those questions, but then, you know, we're talking about 2,000 years of history in a, in a foreign culture. It's just so very rich in that respect. You, you, you really um, can never... Um, draw a line. There's always something new and and something mysterious about uh, uh, about it. And was your experience at that time that the, the the type of yoga that you were practicing and learning didn't match what you were reading in these texts and these yeah, these yes. publications? That there was they seemed to almost be talking about you know different different things called yoga. Yes, and 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 even the differences between the modern styles. I. I mean, Simon was a physiotherapist who'd studied with uh, Iyengar, but also had, a, had an interest in Ashtanga and Desikachar's teachings. So he knew a lot about, uh, you might say, Krishnamacharya's yoga. Mm -hmm. 
uh, as well as physiotherapy. He bring a lot of anatomy and physiology to the teachings. But I also went to a Shivananda yoga teacher in Sydney, um, Acharya Upendra Roy. And he was a fascinating character. He'd spend a lot of his classes just seated uh, sort of on a dais um, talking about his past experiences in India while sort of, in, you know, sort of telling the, the class, well, why don't you try Mayurasana? And while everyone's going red in the face, he'd be talking about, uh, you know, his uh, teacher at the, at the Shivananda um, ashram and, uh, and, you know, re really quite a, um, uh, an interesting uh, character. And I, I suppose I never uh, limited myself to one style of yoga. I always felt that the modern styles offered uh, a slice or an aspect of yoga. Perhaps that was the advantage of studying some of its history at an early point. Mm. And then, you know, another, um, of course, another benefit of studying um, Sanskrit and Hindi academically um, was that, you know, I, I had access to a very uh, rich environment at Sydney University at the Indian mm -hmm. Studies Department. Uh, my teacher there, Peter Oldmeadow, he'd spent many years in India, was an expert in, in Buddhism uh, and Sanskrit. And there were many visiting um, scholars as well as uh, students. And I also remember that studying Hindi there required me to go to India for one month to do a summer school. I, in fact, I did, I did it twice. Mm. And, and that summer school was held in Rishikesh of all places. Oh, wow. So this was in 1999 and the year 2000. And I remember I lived in India between the summer school. So this, I think the summer school was held in January and I spent most of the following months in India and then did the, follow, did the following summer school in January. And I think I spent nine months in Rishikesh mm -hmm. uh, that year and going to the Shivananda ashram uh, to, to the various yoga teachers who were teaching in Rishikesh. That was, again, another world of mystery in many respects and unanswered questions. Um, Shivananda Yoga has a particular focus. It has a strong emphasis on bhakti, particularly if you're going to the ashram, uh, the, the morning and evening pujas, the kirtans and so forth. Uh, there are also other in interesting yoga teachers passing through, a Hungarian lady, I remember, who was teaching Iyengi yoga at the Om Karananda ashram. Her classes were very enjoyable and, and she was absolutely de devoted to Mr. Iyengar and would spend many months in Pune studying with him. She was very inspiring. There was another senior I Iyengar teacher in Rishikesh at that time, Rudra Dev. I uh, went to some of his classes and I remember his classes were absolutely full at that time, maybe 20 or 30 um, people crammed into, into, into his uh, yoga studio. And of course, those students were coming from all parts of the world. It was an international um, group and just talking to other people about their experiences in yoga why they were there, what they were wanting to learn. Some of them were teachers, some of them had their own yoga studios. Uh, that too was a rich uh, learning experience. Yeah, that was probably a very interesting time uh, in the yoga world uh, to be doing yoga in Rishikesh in India, kind of early 2000s. Seems like that was right around when this kind of wave of kind of a global postural yoga boom was taking place. Uh, yes, and that, that, that was apparent in Rishikesh, I do remember, because there was a sort of an old world and, and a new world in Rishikesh that, uh, mm -hmm. that was starting to um, clash in many respects. You, you had um, the Shivananda ashram and the teachers associated with that ashram doing what they'd been doing for um, 10 years or more. And then you had more foreigners coming in and more money uh, sort of coming into, I suppose, Rishikesh for the practice of yoga. And then a festival, a sort of an international yoga festival was, was started around that time. It was a very small affair in the beginning. Um, there were other, you know, many other ashrams that were making a transition 
between um, a sort of an, an older audience and, and, and this new wave of people coming in for yoga. And right. Yeah, so that, that was interesting to see. I didn't at the time understand what was going on, but I do now see that. And of course, if one is aware of how Rishikesh has developed since that time, it's of course become much more commercial and that, that international yoga festival is a huge event now and it's probably one of many um, and the ashrams back then that were just starting to become aware of the international interest in yoga and the benefits that that might have for them are now well aware of that and have tried to accommodate it in all sorts of ways yeah and i think that that time was also right before uh this kind of new wave of modern yoga studies and new scholarship that started to emerge that was turning to analyze and to to study these processes and, and global yogas and looking at places like Rishikesh and that international yoga scene. Um, I'm thinking of, was, I think it was Sarah Strauss, if I'm not mistaken. There was this book on transnational yoga in Rishikesh published maybe in 2004. Yes, I think I'm getting that name correctly, and then and then you had Joe Alter's book, and Elizabeth De Michaelis, and those were kind of all around 2004, 2005. And I yes, feel I like, think I think know. Joseph Alter, some of his articles had come out uh, before then, but one of the great frustrations uh, that I do remember when I when starting to to learn and practice yoga was the lack of. Um, solid work on on its history so i would often have questions about a style of yoga where it came from why it was you know why it was so different to other styles and it was in many cases very difficult to find uh you know a, a sort of a i suppose a sectarian uh, or non a non-secular uh, i mean sorry a secular look at at the history um, so a lot of the publications back then were um, very much um, filled with with the myths and the folklores of yoga, which was which was fine, very interesting. But I think it's also important to um, to understand some of the historical events behind uh, those myths and, and folklores, and and that was not so readily available um, when I started practicing it. And it was a motivating factor, I suppose, for my continuing study of the academic uh, side of yoga. Yeah. So how did that continue to develop uh, after your BA? And you then had these experiences training in Hindi and Sanskrit, and you were sort of being exposed to the fields. You were also uh, furthering your own yoga practice uh, at, the, at the same time, how did this then develop into you pursuing further graduate studies and you ending up at Oxford for the DPhil? Uh, well, after my BA, I did an honours uh, thesis with uh, an honours year with Dr. Peter Oldmeadow. And my um, proposal for that year of extra research was to do a translation and study of a text called the Amanaskar. This text had been suggested to me by David White. I'd read his book, Our Chemical Body. At the time, that book was perhaps one of the few comprehensive um, studies of the, the history of yoga and, and, and in that case, alchemy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could see from that, that, from that work that there was an enormous amount of textual material that hadn't really been studied. So I contacted David asked for his advice and he suggested a text, a text called the Amanaskar. Mm. I obtained a copy of it, a printed edition that was um, difficult to get hold of, but there was a couple of copies uh, in Australia. And I started to study that text and it was in, you know, it was a printed edition, I think published first in, in the 1960s and it was in terrible condition. There, mm -hmm. there were, many problems with the text, many ungrammatical verses, and a lot of it didn't make sense just, just from, from that uh, perspective alone. So I reached a point where 
I, I sort of had to discuss with Peter whether to continue with the work because my initial proposal was just to translate it and study its content. Mm-hmm. And he suggested that I talk to a scholar who had done a lot of work collecting manuscripts in India um, on um, uh, on Jainism. He, he was studying at uh, the Australian National University. His name was Dr. Royce Wiles. Mm. And he suggested to me that uh, in, in the situation I face that I should have a look at some manuscripts to see whether they help uh, elucidate some of the problems with the printed edition. And he gave me a lot of advice on how to go about doing that, um, the catalogues that I needed to, to, to read, the places in India I needed to visit. And so I think it was 2004, I set, up, set out on a manuscript hunting uh, expedition, you might say, for three months. I planned to visit six libraries, three in South India, three in North India. And I managed to get, I think, three manuscripts, perhaps four, three or four manuscripts of, of the, uh, uh, of the Amanaska. My, uh, my success was impeded to a large extent because the very first library I visited was the Asiatic Society of Bengal in Calcutta, which is actually one of the hardest libraries to deal with. Yeah, I've heard um, that. And Yes, and I was completely unaware of this and, uh, and naive about how to deal with librarians. And in many instances, I, I was there for six weeks, actually, trying to, to get the material I wanted because for some reason I thought that I would always get it. I was entitled to it, that I was you know, just going to any library and it was um, just a matter of asking for the material and and that I would eventually get it. And in many respects, the obstacles that were and the, and the delays that, that occurred at the time, I couldn't believe them. It was sort of like a, like a comedy sketch at times taking place. And I know, there was always- yeah, I know the episode. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, if you had a camera at the time, and, and this is not just the case with the Asiatic Society of Bengal, if you, you, you could sort of do a series of, skits, uh, real life skits, if you, you're, if you're able to capture the moments um, at various libraries and, uh, and put them together. But uh, I suppose at the time I, I just didn't, I wasn't expecting it. So it was all very fresh and, and, and so I had much more tolerance for it and was able to persevere. Whereas if it happens now, I must say, I get uh, quite angry and mm. funnily enough, I don't, I don't have the tolerance for it and, and I end up usually leaving mm. if I think that it's going to be too difficult. Well, you're very, um, I, you're very seasoned now, and you, and, you, and you know what you're looking for. And, and, and well, in that in that respect, it hasn't helped because um, uh, you know my my ability to deal with librarians and uh, uh, to sort of remain calm and negotiate in 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 a sort of a measured way has actually deteriorated. Mm. Um, if, if it's not going well. I mean, in many respects, I must say, going to an Indian library can, can be um, a wonderful experience. So I've had instances where the librarian has taken me on a personal tour of the library, showed me their most valuable uh, material and provided me with copies of uh, manuscripts free of charge mm-hmm. with, with plenty of cups of tea and, um, and stimulating discussions about Sanskrit and the history of uh, of India. So, I must say, in some respects, you can walk away from a library, um, uh, you know, com- completely uplifted and inspired by the experience. And then, in other cases, it's it's absolutely devastating. Particularly when you go to a library that you know has very important material, perhaps an old manuscript of the text that you might be working on. And if you don't, if you can't. Even, you know, if you can't get a copy of it or perhaps even see it, it at the time, it, it feels like um, you're being deprived of the opportunity to do good work, of, of the opportunity to, um, you know, to, to do what, what needs to be done. Uh, yeah, Jason, just for our listeners who are maybe just a little less familiar with this process and what you're describing, I mean, tell us a little bit about you know, the, these libraries and archives, you know, holding these manuscripts, 
And what are some of these challenges? Why, why are you having trouble accessing manuscripts at these libraries? Why can't you simply, as you said, just show up and you've got your scholarly credentials? You, here's the listing in the catalog. Why can't you just retrieve the manuscript, make a copy of it, and, and carry on with your work? Yes, I must say it's very uh, unpredictable how things will go at a library. Uh, there are state-run libraries. They're, some of them are very large. They have a, collections of over 50,000 manuscripts and many people working at the library. And there's quite a hierarchy from the person who goes into the archives and fetches uh, the material to the librarian and then the director of the library. So, some of these larger institutions have a board of directors or a committee that one also needs to deal with. And in some cases, you actually need to deal with a local politician uh, to get permission to copy something. Um, so sometimes walking into a small library um, can be a very different experience to walking into a large institution. It may be that the, the librarian is the only person working in the library and they, I sometimes get the feeling that they haven't seen someone for a long time. And, so often in that case, it can be a very uh, good experience. You, you, you sort of, can, the librarian's willing to talk, find out what you're doing and, and how he or she can help. Uh, in other libraries, it can depend very much on the work culture. Um, in many cases, the requests that a scholar makes to a librarian uh, may just be extra work. Uh, it can be difficult to find material in the archives uh, there's often a lot of rules and regulations to follow, particularly if the scholar's requesting copies, a lot of paperwork to fill out. So I sometimes think when, I, when, an, in, when a librarian is not very helpful, not very enthusiastic, that it's simply because they're not wanting to, um, to do that, that extra work that they mm -hmm. would otherwise not have to do. Yeah, do you think, I mean, are there other maybe even not to get too into the political matters of this, but you know, uh, are, is there sometimes skepticism or mistrust of a non-Indian scholar coming into uh, one of these institutes, um, well, one of the, one of the fun credentials? And there's, is there a mistrust of what a scholar is perhaps going to do with some of these materials? Yes, yeah, sometimes there is a paranoia that um, oh, a foreign scholar will uh, take the material and, and I've had this said to me by some librarians, uh, take the material, go overseas, publish it, make an enormous amount of money, and the precious thing that they think they're guarding will no longer be uh, of any value. Mm -hmm. I've had some librarians express that. But I must say, on the whole, Indian scholars often struggle as much as foreign scholars in accessing this material. And that's something mm -hmm. I've been surprised at over the years, particularly working with pundits at the EFEO. Uh, right. They've often gone to the same libraries that I have in South India. And in some cases, they have even greater difficulties. I remember one case where I visited a library with a research assistant who, uh, who was accompanying me, but, but, uh, but we went into the library separately um, because this particular library had a limit on the amount of uh, manuscripts that a, that a person could uh, copy. Mm. So we thought if, if the librarian thought we were connected, they might limit the number of manuscripts we could copy to, um, uh, to, to, to the minimum. Whereas if we went in separately, then, then both of us would get the, the minimum uh, amount. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, he went uh, early in the morning, he went actually to the temple beforehand, um, uh, was was dressed up immaculately um, in in his uh, dhoti and uh, uh, you know his hair combed and so forth, and he went in uh, planning to make I think quite an impression, and it just so happened that the um, that the librarian was was Muslim, and when she saw him all dressed up, uh, been to the temple, and so forth. He had, he, he had a lot of trouble dealing with, with her. She was not particularly wanting to help him. And he went in before me 
Mm. And I remember he came out uh, almost in tears uh, saying, oh, I don't think she's going to help at all. I tried. I, she even made me read uh, some of the manuscripts to prove I could uh, read Sanskrit. And um, she just uh, he seemed very unhelpful. And then I went in and I didn't have to read any of the manuscripts. I, I fortunately had the, the right paperwork. She was very strict about the rules. I could only copy, I think, two manuscripts, which was part of the problem we were facing. We wanted copies of 20 or 30 manuscripts. But nonetheless, she was reasonably polite. So, you know, that, that indicated to me that, again, it's very unpredictable. It could have been the other way around. Sure. Um, but, uh, yes, often Indian scholars face tremendous difficulties and, um, and also funding can be difficult, you know, to go to the other side of India um, to, to pay for accommodation, particularly if the library is slow and you, you have to spend a week or two there to get the material. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it requires funding. Well, it's a, real, it's a real tragedy in many cases. I mean, I, I think we, we do want to be sensitive to and, and understand that there are, you know, histories of, of colonialism that are at play in, in some of this. And, you know, I think there's perhaps some good deal of skepticism, uh, you know, perhaps stemming from that, you know, uh, it is true that, you know, Indian culture and um, texts and uh, sculptures and you name it have been poached and, you know, have, you know, uh, been exported and are now found in museums in London and around the world. And I think there's you know, a good reason to want to hold on, you know, you could say to, to those sort of cultural treasures. But, yes. at, at the, but at the same time, now it's to such an extent that these manuscripts that are just sitting there rotting and then not being opened up to anyone you know, whether, you know, foreign or Indian scholar, as, as you're sharing in some cases, that doesn't serve anybody. And it's really quite unfortunate that, you know, um, some of these, some of these texts now that could actually really contribute to our understanding in this, in this case for us of the history and development of yoga, but think about what these manuscripts and archives are holding so much more vast treasures of history, philosophy, literature, and culture. Um, what what a waste to just have those be sitting there, right? That's right. And I, I might add that, funnily enough, the libraries that are often the most difficult to deal with in, in the sense that they just don't want to let scholars see their, their work or give copies of uh, manuscripts are often the libraries that are doing the worst job in looking after their collections. Mm. They're often the libraries where you request to see manuscripts and they can't find them. Um, now, whether that's because they've they've been misplaced or, you know, um, perhaps the, the greater fear is that, that they may well have disappeared um, or whether it's the fact that um, the manuscript, as you say, might be rotting on the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, these are, yeah, the, it's often the libraries that, that, that are the least helpful that, that, is, um, that, that have these problems. And I have indeed, um, gone to libraries, uh, seen a manuscript, say, in uh, 2004 or 2008. When I was there, it was in terrible condition. And then I've gone back at a later time to request it, and they can't find it, or, or you get the feeling that because it was in a terrible condition that it's perhaps since perished and they've uh, thrown away. So material is being lost. There, there is some urgency mm -hmm. in, the, in the type of work that we're doing, particularly in an area where it's, you know, essential to look at the manuscript material where texts haven't been uh, edited in the past. There are not necessarily printed editions of the material we want to work on. So there is urgency that the, the tradition of copying manuscripts has pretty much died out in India. Mm -hmm. So a manuscript, particularly in the more tropical parts of India may last a hundred or 200 years before it deteriorates. Uh, there's also the risk of it being eaten by worms and insects. And in the past, when that was happening, the manuscript would usually be copied by a scribe. Mm. 
and there would have been a, an industry of scribes um, who were performing that task. And that's not being done today. It's, uh, I, I think the, the main effort um, to preserve this, this amazing um, uh, archive of, of India's history, the main efforts that are, that are going on today are to photograph or digitize the manuscripts. And I must say in many Indian libraries that, that is taking place. And sometimes they're using very good technology. So the scans uh, can be very good and, 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 the, and the archive well organized. Um, and that's heartening. It, it's also very heartening when working with librarians and pundits who clearly understand the situation, understand the importance of the material that it's um, uh, that, that it's decaying and needs to be preserved and, and, and are doing a tremendous effort um, in, in conservation and, and the study of the material as well. Yes. So maybe we can circle back to this when we get later in this conversation to your work on the Hatha Byasa Parati and its manuscript uh, history and, and situation. Um, but we, we I, I'm afraid I let us get a little sidetracked. I wanted to uh, get back to your fascinating and important work on the Amanaska, which uh -huh. started as your MA project, but then um, also became your DPhil thesis at Oxford, where you worked under Professor Alexis Sanderson. So how did that project um, develop? And tell us, you know, a, a little bit more about this text, the Amanaska, and how this, you know, once you found these manuscripts, um, how did that develop into a fuller project? And how did these manuscripts, you know, tell a fuller picture of this text? Yeah, so I ended up doing a critical edition based on three or four manuscripts for my honours thesis. And I remember at the time I submitted that, or it may have been shortly afterwards, that uh, James Mallinson published his book on uh, the Kechari Vidya, or perhaps I saw his thesis. He finished his thesis earlier. Mm. I found a copy of his thesis on the internet. And I realised that the sort of format that he used and the, um, uh, the extent of the manuscript material, his collating, technique of collating and editing and so forth was exactly what I, what I wanted to do or what I needed to do mm. to, um, uh, to do a, uh, you know, a good edition and annotated translation of the Amanaskar. So I, I immediately got in touch with him. We had um, uh, correspondence for many years. I think this started in 2006 or 2007. And uh, and he at one point, I mean, he saw the work I was doing, and, and at one point he suggested that I apply to study with Alexis Sanderson because he said uh, Alexis has, uh, has supervised many critical editions, and if I wanted to do uh, a doctorate, he was probably the best person that I could study with. So I, I, I made the application. I felt I had no chance because for an Australian studying in Oxford, the, the fees were astronomical. As a foreign student, I think they were 90,000 uh, pounds for th three years or, or so. Yeah, I remember looking at that and think facing that same obstacle as a US student considering applying. And uh, Yes, well, this was 2008. So, so now, now it would be much higher because they've had a, um, I think the fees have been um, revised uh, since that time. So it would be even more expensive now. And limited scholarship opportunities for foreign that's, students. That's right. There are very limited um, uh, scholarship opportunities. I, I was fortunate enough to win the Clarendon Fund. Mm. Uh, and I realize now again that, that uh, I was, you know, my application and the fact that I was applying to Oxford at that time was it was just very fortuitous that what I proposed to do was exactly the sort of work that I think Alexis uh, was willing to supervise. I was looking at a Shaiva text. Mm -hmm. It had interesting connections with an early Jain scholar, Hemachandra, which meant that it was uh, uh, composed at a, a fairly early time for this, for this genre, before the 12th century. 
um, I, he realized I was looking at the manuscripts and that there was a lot more manuscript material in the catalogs that I should look at. Um, and I think he also saw, because I, I sent um, Alexis uh, my thesis, he could also see that the text itself had a lot of connections with earlier Shaiva traditions that I would obviously flesh out and, and investigate mm -hmm. uh, when, when doing my uh, doctorate. So he obviously supported my application and fortunately uh, the funding body, the Clarendon Fund, uh, saw the, um, uh, the potential of it as well. And the, of course, the other, you know, the other great benefit I had studying at Oxford was that James Mallinson was, was there as well. And there were many other scholars working in Shaivism who were able to help me, not, not only with the history, but also with the, um, the critical editing, the software um, that was best to use for it. And, and so I couldn't, in, in hindsight, I couldn't really have gone to a better place to, to, to do the research. Um, and it set me on the path. It was basically um, the collaborative, a lot of the collaborative work that Jim and myself did during that time that made it clear to us by the time I finished my doctorate that there was an enormous amount of further work that could be done and, and that we could do mm. if we had further funding. So that resulted in an, an application to the AHRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council of Australia, we of of um, of the UK, sorry, uh, and that resulted in an application application where we proposed to uh, edit and translate ten texts. It got very good reviews, but the AHRC said it was not urgent enough to fund at that time, so we missed out on the funding. But that became the kernel of the. Um, application that was made to the European Research Council that resulted in the Hatha Yoga project. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so that was the, um, I suppose, the progression from. Um, yeah. You know, now, before we get into the text and, and the research you've been doing for this Hatha Yoga project, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Raja Yoga before we shift to Hatha Yoga explicitly, because I think. <laughs> You know, one of the, the the unique contributions of your work and this text, the Amanaska, that you worked on for your DPhil, is uh, fleshing out our understanding even of this phrase, Raja Yoga, you know, and what it has referred to historically. So today, of course, you know, when most, you know, yoga practitioners or yoga teachers talk about Raja Yoga, they typically, you know, um, understand that term as relating to the teachings of Patanjali and the Yoga Sutra. But as your work and others has borne out, historically, this is not necessarily the case, right? So what, what does Raja Yoga mean in pre-modern texts? And do you consider the Amanaska to be a Raja Yoga text? And kind of why or, or why not? Well, the, the Amanaska um, calls its yoga Raja Yoga. So it's it's quite explicit in that regard. It is it is Raja Yoga. It's uh, it states that at the at the beginning of the text, and it defines Raja Yoga as the king of all yogas. Now the Amanaska is a is uh, a little bit different to the subsequent works. I mean, I think it is the earliest work that we have on Raja Yoga. Um, it uh, dates to probably the eleventh century, maybe maybe the early twelfth century, and it teaches Raja Yoga as really a type of yoga that can be practiced by anyone. It's a fairly sort of simple, easy practice, a sukho paya, a sort of a, uh, an easy method. Mm. And it's completely autonomous in the sense that uh, it does not require any um, auxiliary practice. Even though at the beginning of the text, Vamadeva, who's who's asking Shiva for the teachings on Raja Yoga, begins by saying, "Well, I've learnt a preliminary yoga, and now I want to 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 know the advanced yoga. Mm. Can you please can you please teach me?" And then um, Shiva says, "Well, yes, I'll teach you 
the advanced yoga. It's called Raja Yoga. It's the king of all yogas. And it's the uh, yoga that uh, enables the, the practitioner to attain the self or to, to sort of um, understand the self, which, uh, which is often referred to as the king of all beings. So it's playing on that type of uh, metaphor that, that goes back to the Upanishads, or some of the early Upanishads. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a distinct type of yoga. It's, it's very much focused on the practice of samadhi. And so amanaskar, the term amanaskar, means no mind state. And amanaskar, unmani, um, samadhi, the various terms that are used for this meditative state are very, um, you know, very much consistent with Patanjali's definition of yoga. Um, mm-hmm. Chitta Vritti Nirodaha yoga um, is um, a cessation of mental activity. So Raja Yoga it, itself, the term was often used to denote the, this meditative state. Mm-hmm. And perhaps one of the distinctions between Patanjali and this Shaiva form of Raja Yoga was uh, that there's very much there's a strong emphasis on absence of mental activity, but also a strong emphasis on the cessation of breathing. So the meditative state is often described as being um, uh, free of mental activity, but also at some point the yogi's breath stops or perhaps becomes imperceptible, disappears uh, is, is often uh, the, the best way to, to understand uh, the dialogue. So around, you so, so you, you think that. there are some at least conceptual overlaps with Patanjali in the Yoga Sutra and his goal of Chitta Vritti Narodaha as Samadhi, and that you do see some continuity in that formulation of, of yoga as Samadhi and this sort of cessation of mental activity with a text like the Amanaska promoting this Sukhopaya, so-called easy path, which I want to come back to, um, as, as, as a, a practice that leads one to a very similar type of samadhi. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. In, in, in so far as both systems, but, um, the Patanjali Yoga uh, system and uh, later traditions of Raja Yoga, they both emphasize samadhi. Samadhi is the um, necessary mechanism for achieving liberation if the yogi does not achieve samadhi then he does not uh, he or she does not succeed mm. in, in that regard the the traditions are very different in other ways uh, in in raja yoga there's really only one type of samadhi and it's you might say the highest level where there's no thinking no breathing no um, physical movement in patanjali we get uh, two types of samadhi, samprajnata samadhi, asamprajnata, and mm-hmm. samprajnata, this lower type, which, which seems to depend on an object of meditation, has four different types. Of course, with Patanjali, there's um, a lot of sophistication around the philosophy, particularly the Sankhyan metaphysics and so forth, that's built in to, uh, into its discourse. Of course, all of that is. Um, absent, and in fact, with with Ra- the, the Shaiva traditions of Raja Yoga, there's an antagonism towards philosophy, towards mm-hmm. Tarka reasoning, and uh, so forth. They say these are paths that uh, lead to confusion, and that all one needs to do is practice yoga. And you can read thousands of shastras, thousands thousands of scriptures, and you won't get anywhere unless you you do the practice, unless you actually achieve. Samadhi. So in, in those respects, I think the traditions are quite different, uh, as well as particularly with the Amanaskar, the method for achieving Samadhi is, is very different. Of course, in Patanjali Yoga, there's the Ashtanga system with the eight auxiliaries and also the Kriya Yoga with its uh, um, simpler threefold approach. And the Amanaskar is quite, uh, uh, is, is quite, uh, derogatory, if that's the right word, mm-hmm. uh, uh, towards such graduated systems. It basically says all the auxiliaries are a waste of time. Ashtanga, Sharanga Yoga doesn't work. All you need is to um, practice its method, which which is Shambhavi Mudra. This is a sort of a 
a meditation technique that's, that uh, requires that the eyes be kept uh, half open, half closed and very still. So one's gazing outwards, but the focal point of meditation is within. You, you, uh, the practitioner is supposed to sit in an easy posture, sukhasana, and uh, allows the mind to wander wherever it wants to go. And as long as Shambhavi Mudra is maintained, then eventually the mind comes to rest and samadhi ensues. So the Amanaskar sounds thinks, sounds very easy, very straightforward. I suppose it is, but I get the feeling that one was supposed to do it intensively uh, for however long it took for uh, that's for the state of samadhi to ensue. And so if you're going to do it for long hours, day in and day out, then it's perhaps not so easy. Um, uh, so, but, but at least conceptually, it's very easy. There, there, there's no need to um, study. There's, there's no need to learn difficult, complex techniques. Um, and so you mentioned that the text is critical of these progressive, you know, limbed systems. I know there's a couple of verses that uh, directly criticize the practice of pranayama and mudras, which seems to perhaps be a jab at, you know, what we would call hatha yoga, even if it wasn't necessarily by name. Yeah, it's very, very critical of physical so techniques. What do you, what, what do you think now, you know, um, given, you know, your reading of, uh, of all of these texts, do you, what do you attribute some of that to? What do you think is going on in the background for, for an author of the Amanaska? Do you think that there was these debates that were happening um, um, uh, you know, about the, the most efficacious uh, types of yoga? Um, lift the curtains a little bit for us of like, you know, what might be behind that kind of criticism? Yes, there definitely were such debates, and uh, and the Amanaskar was on on the side that um, that an easy method, a sukhopaya, and a, perhaps a more gnostic approach in the well, not so much in the study of scriptures, but the fact that one could achieve uh, a samadhi that would, would then bring about about a realization of the highest um, level of uh, reality. That that's uh, what the text calls the uh, Paramatattva, um, you know, so in, in many Shaiva systems, there, there is a graduated um, uh, sort of what, what's often referred to as a graduated ontology, a sort of uh, a worldview where there are many different levels of reality that start with the gross elements and lead up to the most um, transcendent and subtle um, reality levels. And the Amanaskar claims that the highest level can be reached, the highest level of understanding can be reached simply through, um, through its practice of Shambhavi Mudra. Um, so on, 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 so it, it, it certainly favours what, what we might call the non-action side of uh, soteriolo soteriology, of, um, uh, you know, of the quest for liberation as opposed to the traditions that favor a more action orientated uh, approach, which of course is um, Patanjali yoga. If one's going to do asana, pranayama, follow the yama, niyama and, um, and, and so forth, mm -hmm. as well as the physical um, styles of yoga, or um, even if it's the recitation of mantras, uh, th these are more, or, or the performance of ritual. These are the sort of more action orientated approaches and the amanaskar is particularly critical of all of them uh, whether it's ritual mantras or whatever basically says that one is wasting one's time in pursuing them that it's unnecessary exertion and of course hatha yoga uh, falls very much with, within that uh, uh, domain mm -hmm. so it 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 foregrounds raja yoga there's really no discussion of any other type of yoga. Uh, Raja yoga is all one needs to do. And most of the text consists of verses just describing the meditative state, which makes it quite interesting. It's, it, it, it's, uh, um, there are some references to physiology at times, you know, the, the, the breath uh, stopping uh, body heat and so forth. But also there's a 
um, a long sequence uh, of attainments that actually takes place over the course of, I think, 24 years. Um, so it's quite fascinating on, on that level. But in terms of practice, actually doing something uh, and, and, and a system of practice, um, it, it doesn't um, elaborate on that whatsoever. It just basically says that that side of yoga is unnecessary. Yeah, and I think then when you get to the Hatha Pradipika, you know, Svatmarama's text, perhaps at the beginning of the 15th century, so maybe a couple hundred years after the Amanaska, uh, seems like, you know, at least in my reading, Svatmarama seems to be responding a bit to some of those critics, perhaps like the author of, of the Amanaska, those who want to see Hatha Yoga as um, unnecessary, even dangerous or superfluous, you know, to, to Raja Yoga. He wants to, right at the beginning of the text, say Hatha Yoga is the stairwell that leads to Raja Yoga. And at many points throughout the text, and it, perhaps even the entire text as a whole, kind of making this case for Hatha Yoga, but showing how it's inseparable from these higher goals of Raja Yoga and Samadhi. Do you, do you, th do you agree with that, that Svat Marama yes, is, is, is responding in some ways to these critics of Hatha Yoga? Absolutely. I think he's following in the um, tradition of the four yogas that we, that we start to see shortly after the Amanaska, where from perhaps the 12th century onwards, uh, uh, Raja Yoga is um, uh, part of a hierarchy of four yogas. It's, it's the highest, the best yoga. And the other three, which is mantra, laya, and hatha yoga, are the means for achieving raja yoga. So this uh, system, perhaps the earliest exposition, is in a text called the Amarauga, one of the texts that we're um, editing and translating for the, uh, for the project. Um, and it's a text I've written an article on from the Journal of Indian Philosophy. Uh, we've found an earlier recension of the work which has enabled us to, to see that it, that it is such an, uh, an early, um, you might say, rudimentary work on Hatha and Raja Yoga. And there it's quite clear that um, Hatha Yoga is a means for attaining Raja Yoga. And I think uh, it's, this fourfold system is perhaps based on four different types of students. So the, the idea is that um, the very um, capable student will perhaps go, the, you, know, might, you might say the exceptional student will be able to undertake the practice of Raja Yoga without practicing Mantra, Laya or Hatha. Mm. But for the students who are less capable, who are not able to just sort of sit in Samadhi, mm. then they um, have to practice one of the other yogas. The least capable practice Mantra Yoga, the slightly more capable Laya and then the uh, you know the more capable again practice hatha yoga. That reminds me of the of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. Actually, there's this lovely little comment at the beginning of the Bhashya of the commentary on the second pada on the sadhana pada. After the first pada on samadhi, on meditative absorption, the second pada on practice then begins, and it says, you know, everything before this first. Pada on Samadhi, that was for those whose minds basically are already in Samadhi. But for everybody who's Vyutana, whose chittas are more agitated, filled with chitta vrittis, mm -hmm. now we're going to lay out Kriya Yoga and then Ashtanga Yoga. So these physical practices, these are for those students who, who need it, right? Yes. And I think the idea of there being four types of student goes back to that time as well, it's mentioned in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. I think it's in the Bhagavad Gita as well. And it seems it continued through, of course, it's in uh, the Amrita city, which, which uh, as we now know, is a Buddhist uh, Tantra that was a source text for the Amarauga. And there we have four types of student. Uh, they're very similar to um, the same um, expositions of the four types of student in the Shiva Samhita and a later version of the Amarauga called the Amarauga Prabodha. And so there it's explicitly said that the you know, four types of student correlate with these four types of yoga. Um, 
So I find the relationship interesting because, you know, if we think of the past debates on, you know, that we see in the Amanaska and earlier Shaiva traditions about easy and difficult techniques, here we're seeing, uh, you know, more action orientated yogas being um, uh, united in a sense or brought together with uh, Raja yoga, this, this um, yoga of complete inactivity, complete stillness, uh, in a way that seems to cater for students who want to go straight into Raja yoga, who have that uh, desire and capability, and then other students who perhaps want to practice um, uh, mantras or the simple meditation techniques of Laya yoga or the um, physical practices of Hatha yoga, being able to pursue that um, path and, 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 and reaching the same goal. Yeah. And as you mentioned earlier, this, of course, changes in the Hatha Pradipika. There the, the relationship is redefined, mantra and laya yoga drop out. Uh, and it's basically a twofold system where Hatha yoga is the sole means to Raja yoga. It's the sort of one uh, size fits all approach. Everybody, um, it seems, has to do Hatha yoga if there's no Hatha yoga, there's no Raja yoga, as Fatmarama says. If there's no Raja yoga, there's, you know, Hatha yoga is pointless. Right. Uh, and so the two yogas be, uh, are bound together. But I might just add that in every text after the Amanaskar, um, Raja yoga is always taught with Hatha yoga. The two become um, almost inseparable in that degree. We, we do get, I think, maybe one or two Hatha yoga texts that fail to mention Raja yoga, but in, in just about all cases, Hatha and Raja yoga go together. And in the Hatha Pradipika itself, the, the largest, or, or you know, one of the largest chapters, the fourth chapter is entirely on Raja yoga. That's interesting. So when people talk about a Raja yoga tradition, is that something historically that we can really speak about well, certainly from a textual point of view, if we're, if we're looking at a, a corpus of literature that um, uh, you know, expounds upon this type of yoga over the centuries and is sort of self-referential in many respects, the Hatha Pradipika um, being a classic uh, example of that, it uh, takes many verses from texts like the Amarauga and the Amanaskar to formulate its teachings and in many respects redefine those teachings. And this is the case throughout the centuries. I think authors are looking back at the earlier texts, taking material and uh, um, recycling it, repurposing it, refashioning it. And I have a feeling that that was happening on the ground as well, that practitioners would be referring uh, to texts or perhaps the guru who would then pass on the teachings orally um, to, uh, to students. Um, so in this respect, we, we see continuity over the, over the centuries. And of course, we also see that um, authors used the teachings of past texts to sanction their innovations as well. Mm. So it may be that, um, you know, new techniques, new physical practices that were, um, uh, that were becoming popular in India at a particular time suddenly are incorporated into Hatha Yoga as say the shut karma as this, these sort of six uh, therapeutic interventions that could assist a yogin who's suffering from excessive phlegm or fat who couldn't necessarily perform pranayama as a beginner then could perform these six um, uh, preliminary practices um, and suddenly that's that's part of um, hatha yoga um, that, that then other authors pick up on and incorporate into their, into their texts. Um, also, of course, um, as you would know, many of the complex postures that were um, absorbed into yoga over the centuries were absorbed under the, old, under the auxiliary of asana, whether it mm. was uh, an Ashtanga system or the fourfold system of the Hatha Pradipika. Uh, it, it, it's, it seems that... Uh, um, you know, the fact that um, some early works mention 84 asanas, the Viveka Martanda, the 12th century Viveka Martanda, the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra being two notable examples, then enabled later 
authors to e incorporate many more postures, even though those early texts seem to suggest that the authors were aware of 84 asanas and then basically say, well, to do Hatha Yoga, all you need is one or two postures, Padmasana and Siddhasana, the, the emphasis of the practice being on Pranayama and Mudra, even though that was the case later, authors and commentators can easily overlook that and say, yes, there are 84 asanas, here's a list of 84, here's descriptions of, of, of 84. And, you know, and then they might expound upon the, the healing benefits of the postures as we see in the Joga Pradipika to basically for every posture talks about the health benefits, the yogic um, benefits such as, you know, raising Kundalini or um, bringing about Samadhi. Uh, yeah, so Jason, let, let's back up a little bit. I want to talk more about this development of asana uh, and particularly, you know, your your contributions to our understanding of the history of asana, which I think has been really one of the one of the big gifts that you've, you've given us in your work. Um, so you, you wrote an article or a chapter rather in the edited volume Yoga and Transformations. The, the chapter is titled The Proliferation of Asanas in late medieval yoga texts. And I really wanna highlight, and lift up this chapter and encourage people to read it because this is based on years and years of this archival work that you've been doing, bringing forth unpublished manuscripts. And I think it really has pushed forward our understanding of the history and development of yoga postures. And this is a, a subject as our listeners will know that has been you know, the subject of some controversy and debate, you know, over, over the years, you know, where do these asanas come from? How many of them are sort of new or have, were developed in the modern period? How many of them actually kind of can be traced back to these pre-modern yoga traditions? And I think, you know, as you do so well in this article, you really map out what we, what we do know, what we don't know based on the historical record. Um, and you highlight how the early texts, as we, as we now well know, teach, as you just mentioned, relatively few asanas. But then around the 16th, maybe 17th century, there's a shift in the number of asanas taught in these manuscripts. So tell us a little bit about, you know, the significance of, of some of these works that you located and, you know, what what we what we now know about the development of asana and and the role of asana and more and more complex asanas that were being taught during this this period yes well as you mentioned i i think the dilemma 20 years ago that scholars faced was the discrepancy between the number of postures that were being taught in india in the early 20th century and the number of postures that they saw in yoga texts the yoga texts being available at the time uh, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra having three sutras on asana, and then the Shiva Samhita, the Hatha Pradipika, uh, teaching 15. I think the Shiva Samhita teaches four. And then the Garanda Samhita was, uh, has been widely available in the 20th century. And that teaches um, 36 postures, but not many of them uh, are the same as the postures that... Um, uh, you know, were taught in the early 20th century. So there was really no way of connecting the dots between the textual sources that were available and the situation that we see in early 20th century India. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, I suppose, partly good fortune. It was, it was just part of my, as you say, my arch archival work that I was able to come across manuscripts that, um, uh, that contain lists or longer um, chapters or descriptions of postural practice. And I must also say that uh, an important pioneer in this area was um, Dr. Goroti, who um, established the Lonavala Yoga Institute and he worked at the Kaivalyadharma Yoga Institute before he established his own um, institution. He uh, did a lot of work in collecting manuscripts, particularly in Maharashtra and Rajasthan that, um, that, that have more information on, uh, on asana, uh, postural practice. And he also 
I did a great service in um, editing and publishing some of these works. Um, so in many respects, I was able to build on what he had done. Uh, I mean, he was, unfortunately, I think he died prematurely and he would have done a lot more valuable work had he uh, had he lived longer. I think he passed away in 2004. Right. And now his son, who's also named Dr. Gorote, now carries on uh, his institute. I had the yeah. I had the fortune to go to go meet him and look at some manuscripts together. Um, oh, great! The novel a few years back. Well, I hope he is, uh, you know, carrying on the work because they they had, you know, because of his father, they they have a, a wonderful collection mm. of uh, of manuscripts, and and there's a lot of work that they could continue to do. Um, and I I had the good fortune of meeting. Uh, Dr. Gorotti, senior, you might say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was a, he, when I met him, I think, which was a year or two before he died, he was very energetic, doing a lot of work. He just published the Hatta Tattva Kalmudi, a very a large uh, book, a la large text on Hatha Yoga. He was working on the Encyclopedia of Asanas, which, which I've also found immensely valuable, yeah. uh, although it's, it's somewhat difficult to use. Um, but yes, I, I, I think his work's been very, um, very important. But I suppose what I was able to see, particularly with, with the help of um, Jim and my earlier research on the history of Hatha and Raja Yoga, I was also able to see some of the chronological development and the fact that the early texts are almost indifferent towards the practice of asana, even though they, they, they do describe um, Siddhasana or Padmasana as being uh, important for the practice. They're, they're, you might say they're rather indifferent towards um, complex asanas, non-seated postures, and how that starts to change after the 15th century, basically after Svatmarama in his Hatha Pradipika incorporates seven uh, non-seated uh, postures. And that, to some extent, seems to open the floodgates. And by the 16th, 17th century, we have texts and compendiums that are expounding on 84 asanas and then others that's like the Hatha Vyasa Padati uh, expounding on 112. Mm. Um, and also, you know, starting to document rather sophisticated forms of postural practices. So again, we have um, scholarly compendiums that basically list and describe asanas like their um, discrete phenomenon and not really giving much information about um, how they were practiced or how they might be put together. Well, I think the Hatha Vyasa Parati is, uh, is an, an exception in that regard. Also, at the moment, we're editing the chapter on asana in the Hatha Sanketa Chandrika, which is the another large um, compendium composed by Sundara Deva. He's the author who wrote the Hatha Tattva Kamudi that I mentioned a moment ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this text is unpublished, and it has a very long chapter on asana. And there we find some fascinating details about uh, its practice, not just the complex poses, but also the seated poses. Uh, so it's really during this time, the, the 16th and 17th century, that we start to, um, to find longer, uh, more detailed discussions of postural practice, some of them foreshadowing the developments that we see in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of this material has been unpublished. So the scholars 20 years ago who were wondering, you know, what the connection was between um, modern and pre-modern practice, uh, I think some of their questions are starting to be answered and we are finding uh, direct connections. We are finding instances where gurus in the early 20th century used texts or collections of asanas um, you know and, and readapted them uh, for, for, a, for a modern audience in, in some cases an international audience mm, fascinating so yeah so one of the important texts um, that you we've, we've mentioned a few times in all of this um, and that you're editing along with mark singleton for the project and that's one of our important sources here for the development of more complex systems of asana is the Hatha Vyasa Padati. Uh, so tell us a little bit about this text, why it's unique, 
its its significance, um, and um, yeah, yeah, what what we've learned about it, you know, over over the last few years of this project. Well, I was fortunate enough fortunate enough to find a manuscript of it uh, in a library in Pune in two thousand and two thousand and uh, um, I think it was two thousand and twelve. And the text had been mentioned in one of um, Dr. Gorotti's uh, publications, I think his Encyclopedia of Asanas, but um, he had really used it as a source work and hadn't given any, any details about its content other than the postures or any systematic analysis because the postures are scattered throughout his uh, encyclopedia. So I went to the library and I was lucky enough to find it because it was it's catalogued under the incorrect name. It's catalogued under the name Asana Banda, uh, whereas I think the beginning of the text provides a more plausible um, name for the work, the Hatha Abhyasa Padati, Padati meaning uh, manual, Abhyasa in practice, Hatha, in this case, Hatha Yoga. Mm. And uh, I remember at, at the time returning to Singapore where Jackie was teaching yoga full time at a yoga school there. And we went through the practice together through the section on asanas together. And of course the, uh, that particular manuscript, the, the descriptions are not in the best shape. There's a lot of scribal errors. Um, the, the, the descriptions are very terse. At the time we didn't realize there was illustrations that could be found um, uh, for, for these asanas. So we undertook, uh, I suppose, uh, a period of experimenting with the with the postures of practicing them. Jackie, in particular, was particularly proactive. There, she also um, came up with the idea of teaching workshops that explored uh, the practice of the postures, and that and that was mm -hmm. really very valuable because we were able to ask a lot of yoga practitioners and teachers what they thought um, uh, the postures were like. You know, what what the ins the instructions were saying and, and and different ways of different possibilities yeah uh, sometimes might, the uh, phrase uh, embodied philology is being used i'm not sure is that something that jackie actually developed yes yes so what she would do when uh, when teaching the postural practice of the hatha Vyasapadati was basically give it um, uh, a translation of the pose and then let everyone experiment with that trying you know and, and so you'd see you'd, you'd look across the the room and you'd see people doing all sorts of different things uh, that were sometimes completely unconnected but of course they're seeing it from a different perspective and sometimes that was very refreshing for us and and, and offered um you know insight into other possibilities well and 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 uh, correct me if i'm wrong but one of the unique aspects of this text is that it does seem to teach asanas in a progressive sequence and so actually performing the asanas is has been quite helpful for you guys in you know uh, understanding even how to translate in certain instances to understand uh, uh, the, the the asanas uh, as a whole as, as a set yes that that's something that came later with with um, with our you know our continued uh, sort of experimentation and mm -hmm. and as we, we we gathered more, information uh, on, on the practice, particularly with the discovery of the uh, Sri Tapanidhi and its uh, uh, illustrated folios that were published by Norman Seoyman in his mm -hmm. tremendously valuable book, The Yoga Traditions of the Mysore Palace. And there we were able to see that uh, it, was the, it was the practice of the Hatha Bhyasa Padati, the postural practice, but all jumbled up. The asanas were in a different sequence. And so the Hatha Vyasa Padati gave us insight into the, the correct order of the postures. And it's easy to see that there is a correct order because often um, one posture will begin with the name of the previous posture. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I thought this could be just a literary mechanism that the author, in order to save space, and we see this in the Hatha Pradipika actually with, uh, with the uh, description of Kukutasana. Mm -hmm. You know, Svatmarama says, um, you know, uh, start in Padmasana. Mm -hmm. 
you know, adopt the position of Padmasana and then explains to the pra practitioner what to do with the, with the arms and the legs. So by describing Padmasana before Kukutasana, the author is able to provide a very succinct definition of the later pose. And to some extent, we thought, well, in the beginning, we thought this was happening in the Hatabhyasa Padati. But then there were um, slowly over time, um, uh, I suppose, clues that, this, that, 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 that there was more happening with, with, this, uh, uh, with this sort of textual uh, description. In many cases, or in some cases, the previous pose didn't really resemble the shape of the following pose. Mm. So if, if you were using this as a literary mechanism, you would really only do it in cases where the previous pose helps you to describe the following pose. And there are instances where the previous pose is a completely different shape. And yet the next pose starts with the name, uh, with the name of that posture. Um, we also saw that because the, de the descriptions are so terse, um, in some cases, it was only possible to understand a posture by knowing the previous shape. And again, this is, this is something that unfolded with the, uh, I suppose, the practical investigations that Jackie and myself undertook with, with the help of other practitioners that, you know, often when going from one pose to another, people would say, oh, well, it, you know, or Jackie would um, often realize herself that actually what you, what you need to do is simply remain in the previous pose and simply move an arm and or, or leg mm -hmm. uh, very simply to achieve the next pose. So then through this process, it, it, it's become much clearer to us that the Hatha Vyasa Padati is uh, in all likelihood teaching six sequences I mean, one of the frustrating, um, uh, you know, one of the frustrating experiences, I suppose, of working with any yoga text is that we can't speak to the author um, <laughs> themselves. Several, maybe in this case, 200 years, 300 years separates us. The author doesn't explicitly say that they are sequences. He does allude to it in a later part of the text, but but if the um, emphasis were on sequencing, you would expect it to be in the section on asana. He doesn't use the word krama in, in that section. He uses um, asana krama in another section and then mm. points to the first pose of one of the sequences. And what about the term right. vinyasa? Yes, that doesn't occur in, in the text, but just to, um, but just to, uh, to, to finish uh, my, my previous thought, um, even even though the author doesn't state explicitly that the uh, postures are sequences, I have a feeling that like many other yoga texts, if it was obvious to the author and obvious to the audience, then he probably felt that he never felt the need to. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, I think he was documenting a sequential practice of asanas. Uh, we see it in the descriptions themselves. One posture leads to another. It's often presumed that, the previous that the practitioner is in the previous posture in order to follow the instructions of the next posture. So in many respects, the instructions are um, describing transitions, and part of the part of the transitions, and this could well be, it could be a an innovation that happened at the time, or again, it, it could be um, documenting a practical part of the tradition that just hadn't made it into a text before this time part of that transition is what you might call linking postures so in the uh the section on the supine postures the which is where the, the yogin lays on his back as in shavasana mm -hmm. uh, shavasana often um is the linking posture between many of the postures in 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 that sequence so I'm, I might also say that another reason why we think the postures are sequential is that if they were categories, so in other words, if the category on supine postures were a category, then you would only expect to see supine postures in that category. Well, what we see in each category of the Hatha Vyasa Padati is a, a tremendous amount of diverse postures. We see inversions, mm 
in the supine sequence. We see twists, we see backbends, mm. um, we see um, uh, uh, tumbles. Um, so, but what? But the consistent uh, element that, that sort of gives some indication of why this sequence was called the supine sequence was because the yogin returns to a supine posture in between the complex asanas. Mm. So he might he might do a backbend and then comes down into Shavasana mm. and then might lift the hips up uh, or bend forward or twist in some way and then return to Shavasana. Uh, it's then, similar to how uh, Shivananda uh, uh, teaching um, sequences uh, are, are taught, right? Um, where they'll often yeah, that is, a restful pose in between. That is an interesting uh, uh, you know, s- similarity. It could be fortuitous. Mm-hmm. I, I also, I, I think we, we see perhaps a more direct connection with Krishnamacharya because we know he had access to, um, well, basically to both the Hatha Vyasa Parati and the Sri Tapaniti. We know he took an interest in those asanas because there's a, a set of sketches that his family still has to this day that he, that, that he was using. Uh, and we can also see that some of the postures um, had an influence on, he, on the um, uh, teachings. I mean, his teachings changed quite considerably over his lifetime. But right. when, he was te- when he was teaching at the Mysore Palace, of course, this vinyasa method uh, was developed. Um, and we see some aspects of that, perhaps the, the idea of linking postures, but also the downward dog pose seems very similar to one of the postures in the Hatha Vyasa Parati called Gajasana, which is a moving asana. So I might also mention that another interesting, or perhaps even unique feature of the Hatha Vyasa Parati is its emphasis on moving asanas. Mm. Many of the asanas are not static. You sort of uh, assume a position and then do a repetitive movement. And Gajasana is, is, a, re- is, is a repetitive movement where you're in a, a, a downward dog-like position, and then you bend the elbows, take the nose down to the floor, and then lift back up into... Um, downward dog. Right. And so in, in, in one of Krishnamacharya's written works, the yoga Makaranda, he gives this list of some of his textual sources for his, for his formulation of yoga. And one of those is this text that you mentioned, the Sri Tattva Nidhi. And so tell us a little bit more. You've mentioned this a few times, but just to, to illuminate this further, what, what do you think is the relationship between the Sri Tattva Nidhi, which we know was a source text for Krishnamacharya's yoga, uh, and its relationship with this Hatabhyasa Parati? Um, well, I think the, the relationship is, um, is clear because uh, the Sri Tattva Nidhi was composed in the mid-19th century, and uh, it, it's a royal digest. It has all sorts of topics, um, f- you know, from uh, games that, uh, that, that the royal family might play, board games and so forth, through to the types of uh, um, architecture and uh, deities that, uh, that they may worship. And it has a chapter on asana. And the, the asanas uh, are the same in particularly the textual descriptions, word for word, with what we see in the Hatha Vyasa Parati. Mm. And, uh, and as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the main difference is that the order of the postures has been lost. We don't exactly know why, but for some reason, the Maharaj or the compilers of the Sri Tapaniti decided that there were 80 um, important postures. So he basically extracted 80 asanas. Not, from, 80, not 84. No, 80. Yeah, for some reason, 80. Yeah. Extracted 80 asanas from the Hatha Vyasa Parati foregrounded those and the other, hun- the other 20 or 30 um, come uh, after those. So it's divided between uh, Mukhyasanas, these, these foremost um, postures, and these Anyasanas, these other postures that are um, described later in the text. And because of this redacting, because of this uh, rewriting, the order of the postures is lost. Mm. Um, Yes, and as you mentioned, we know that uh, Krishnamacharya knew about the Sri Tapaniti. Um, he um, had sketches of, of the postures, and um, 
it, it's quite likely that, that, that it influenced uh, his uh, practice. I might also say that as Norman Seumann um, hypothesizes and as uh, Mark and myself uh, discuss further in a recent article that, uh, that we've written for the Journal of Yoga Studies, I think it's also very clear that Krishnamacharya was influenced by the Vyayama Deepika. This is a, a manual on gymnastics, Vyayama being um, you know, the Sanskrit word for exercise, mm -hmm. that was composed in the late 19th century uh, for, uh, you know, according to the author, for the, the, the health and well-being of, uh, uh, of Indian, I'm not sure if he says Indian children or perhaps Indian people, um, but a lot of the exercises are taken from Indian wrestling. And there's a particular repetitive movement called the joku, which is done between uh, postures, which is very similar to vinyasa. Uh, it's very similar in the sense that there's a sort of an up dog type of movement that we don't see so clearly in the um, Atabhyasa Padati. There's um, bhujasana or bhujangasana. Um, in the Hatha Vyasa Paradi, but it's not connected to Gajasana. Mm. But there you have this sort of um, up dog movement. And then the practitioner then takes the hips back to a downward like position, a downward dog like position, but with the knees bent. And that's perhaps where Krishna Macharya was influenced by the Hatha Vyasa Paradi because, you know, downward dog, of course, has the legs straight and the gazing point is the navel. And these are two characteristics to features of Gajasana in the Hatha Vyasa Padati. So I think it's, uh, it's right to say that Krishnamacharya was a little bit like a bower bird collecting mm. uh, things from all sorts of places. He was influenced by the um, physical culture of, the, of, of Mysore when he was there in the early 20th century. And he had various textual, textual sources at his disposal. He had teachings, of course, from his own guru, and he put them together to formulate a system of physical practice for the children at the Mysore Palace. Yeah. And in that way, you know, not so unlike other innovators and Sanskrit authors of yoga texts before him, you know, like Svatmarama or others who were um, consolidating various texts and traditions and compiling and formulating that within a particular traditional approach, but innovating nonetheless. And that's how these traditions seem to move forward. You know, another, we're, we're, we're kind of winding down our time here, but I'd really be remiss if I didn't ask you about this other really interesting and suggestive connection between Krishnamacharya's yoga teachings and even lore and the Hatha Vyasa Padati, and that is uh, this possible connection with the so-called uh, Yoga Kurunta or Yoga you know, Kuruntaka, these, these various names, but this somewhat legendary text that's supposed to be a source text for the Krishnamacharya tradition, and then these connections with the, the name of the author of the Hatha Vyasa Padati. I know this is a somewhat complex um, story with different puzzle pieces here, and you and Mark do a fantastic job of laying all of this out in the Journal of Yoga Studies article that you just mentioned, and which we'll link to in the show notes. But if you could give us the Cliff Notes version of, you know, what is the latest thinking about this possible connection between the author of the Hatabhyasa Parati and this so-called yoga kurunta of Krishnamacharya? Yes, well, I think uh, our conclusions are quite speculative because until we see the yoga kurunta, it's very difficult to, to make uh, concrete um, uh, judgments and conclusions about it, particularly when one becomes aware of the discrepancies between um, what people have said about this text, whether it's um, Krishnamacharya's uh, students, Iyengar, uh, um, Patabi Joyce, uh, Desikachar, or their students, uh, it's uh, you know it's it's often difficult to uh, some some of the the claims are, uh, are contradictory. Uh, 
so it's often difficult to know just exactly what was in that text uh, or what it was like. But, of course, the name Kurunta is um, very similar to the, to the name uh, Kapala Kuruntika, in, insofar, I, I suppose, as the term Kuruntika is, uh, um, uh, is, is the same. Kapala, again, we don't know who Kapala Kuruntika is. He's said to be the, uh, the author or, or the um, source of the teachings in the Hatha Vyasa Padati. He's probably a Siddha in the, in the lineage of uh, Gorakshanata, Svatmarama, and so forth. Because there is a um, because at the beginning of the Hatha Vyasa Padati, he's one of the um, uh, you know one of the um, you can't really say yeah I suppose people among gods who is uh, paid homage to at the beginning of the text so you get to Kapala Kuruntakaya Namaha along with um, uh, you know various other deities and so forth so he's probably a, a siddha famous teaching uh, teacher of Hatha Yoga, and these teachings were attributed uh, to him. Now, there is also the mention of a, uh, a Kurunta in the Hatha Pradipika. Mm. Whether that's the same as Kapala Kurunta is, mm. is again, difficult to, to speculate on. And so it could well be that the, that Krishnamacharya was aware of the, you know, saw the Hatha Vyasa Padati, saw that it was written by Kapala Karantika, and then referred to the text as the Yoga, um, as the Yoga Karanta. The, the the manuscript that we have is incomplete, mm -hmm. so he may well have had access to a complete manuscript of it, and that may have provided more details. It may have actually had the name Yoga uh, Karanta. Um, Yes, so there's there's um, many speculations that can be made about yeah. that. But because we have no manuscript by that name, uh, it, it it remains a bit speculative. Those connections. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Well, um, uh, this has been a really rich and fascinating conversation, Jason. And as we start to wind things down now here at the end. Uh, I'd like to ask you just sort of a, a more practical question, if you don't mind. And this just just thinking about, uh, you know, the the implications of this research, uh, and you know, perhaps our our broader audience of listeners, and you know, for the yoga world, you know, uh, for non academics, you know, uh, why do you think that this this scholarship and and all these things we've been talking about? What, why is the history of yoga important for students and teachers of yoga today? Well, the history is a tremendous resource. Uh, it's a huge resource because it goes back 2,000 years. And one of the extraordinary things about India is that it has so much written material from the past, um, even though, uh, as, as I mentioned, some of that material is, uh, is, is being lost, or a lot of it is being lost. Uh, there's an enormous amount of it uh, um, in archives that goes back, uh, that, that preserves texts that were written 2,000 years ago, and they were practicing techniques that um, people today are practicing. And, of course, when yoga was transmitted um, to students out, outside of India, to an international audience, uh, the gurus who were teaching it were often referring to the history. They were using texts like the Yoga Sutra, the Hatha Pradipika. They, I mean, if you look at Shivananda's book on Yogasanas, um, there's a tremendous amount of folklore in that book that refers to the historical sources or some of the ideas that come out of the texts. You know, the idea that, um, uh, you know, a, a particular posture like Padmasana is. Uh, is, is important um, in, in the uh, uh, tradition of yoga, or that um, uh, headstand has various names. Uh, we can see that the names that Shivananda cites mm. all go back to earlier texts that, that he was obviously uh, aware of. Uh, so I think the history has always been there with, with the transmission of teachings. And of course, as, the, as yoga has changed over the, the past decades as it's, as it's being um, 
practiced in different environments by different people with different needs, then that history is often reinterpreted. Um, again, different parts in the history um, are emphasized, other, other parts um, uh, perhaps ignored. And yes, and so I think that the work we're doing will basically provide more information, more resources for students and teachers to investigate um, what they themselves may have learnt from, particularly if they're learning what Elizabeth D. Michaelis has called a transnational yoga, a yoga that's sort of coming more directly from India, such as um, Ashtanga Vinyasa or Shivananda yoga and so forth. Uh, the work we are doing will provide more um, resources. It will provide access to many of the primary sources so people can read them for themselves. We'll try to provide annotated translations. So that means the, the, the translation has additional information that helps to make it uh, comprehensible. And I think, of course, for future research, for future um, study of yoga, in some ways we're laying the foundation for the next generation of scholars by providing critical editions, by um, uh, collecting manuscripts, looking at the different versions of a text that have, that have existed over the centuries, the relationship between the texts and so forth. This is something that, um, future scholars and practitioners can read and you know, um, formulate their own ideas about and come up, I'm sure, with, with um, other avenues of research. Mm, absolutely. I mean, personally, uh, just take the opportunity to say, you know, this, your, your work uh, has been tremendously inspiring and, and laying groundwork uh, for my own um, you know, doctoral research. Uh, and I, I know for, for many others who are sort of coming up in this field and for the broader yoga community who are just genuinely interested in um, this broader history and understanding the development of these practices and traditions and, and where all this comes from. As you are coming to the end of the Hatha Yoga project uh, and you're now working on the critical editions and translations, um, are you also working on a full-length book and monograph uh, as a part of the, the output of this project? Yes, although funnily enough, that book is in a preliminary stage. I'm basically um, publishing or uh, finalizing and finishing books on each of the texts that I'm, that I'm working on. So there are six texts that I'm directly involved in, and so that will basically be be six small texts and I think we uh, six small books I might say and I think we I sort of have to work that way along with with Jim and Mark because that's the foundation for um, you know for future books that provide a broader history uh, about yoga and delve into into related issues um, I, I think um, I think we've all uh, really understood how much the history changes as as we uh, delve into the manuscripts of the text. Uh, we see that the text that everybody thinks, uh, you know, was was the original text. Suddenly, we find an earlier recension, and we see that it's it's quite different, or, you know, significantly different, and much earlier than what we thought. Um, so, I really I think we need to, um, in a sense, have a solid foundation of critical editions before we then start to write broader books and perhaps more accessible books uh, on the history of yoga that that we won't have to rewrite in you know in the near future uh, when we um, you know find further manuscript evidence or do further critical editions that uh, show us a very different view um, of a text so I, really I think the next step is to edit the Hatha Pradipika. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do that now that we've we've worked so extensively on the earlier works that Svatmarama used to compile that text. Um, and then after that, there's some very important compendiums that were written from the 16th and 17th century that tell us a lot about yoga in the early modern mm 
period, how it was um, being combined with, uh, how physical yoga was being combined with Patanjali yoga, um, how, you know, particularly Vedantic um, gurus took a strong interest in yoga, despite the teachings of Shankara and others that sort of say that gnosis, you know, knowledge is really the key to liberation. We, we find Vedantic teachers who trace their lineage back to Shankara writing huge texts about yoga mm -hmm. in the 16th and 17th century. And I think some of those texts quite, uh, um, uh, you know, they anticipate the t some of the teachings that we see in the early 20th century, some of the discourse around yoga where you'll see um, someone such as Swami Kuvalayananda um, uh, talking about on the one hand, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, um, and the Yoga Sutras, and then writing a book um, on asanas that has lots of postures not mentioned in those texts, um, but and not really citing this, any textual sources. Well, in a sense, we sort of see that in the um, 16th and 17th century with these Vedantic um, teachers, you know, writing ex extensively about yoga in, Pat in Patanjali's Yoga Shastra, the Upanishads and so on, and then also um, writing extensively about physical yoga. Yeah, the, uh, sometimes I call the Vedanticization of yoga that seems to have occurred and had a strong influence on the shaping of, of, uh, of modern yoga and uh, thinkers such as Vivekananda and others. Well, well, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, I know uh, we're very excited to see the, the fruits of all of this hard labor in the form of uh, the publications of these uh, Sanskrit yoga texts, these critical editions and English translations. Uh, I think it will be uh, an incredible boon and service to us all to be able to read these original primary source texts uh, and um, we, we really look forward to that. So uh, I wish you well and good health. And thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Seth, for, again, for the invitation, for your uh, very uh, astute and, uh, and kind questions. And I also thank anybody who's made it this far <laughs> in, in listening to the podcast. Well, thank you so much, Jason. We'll, we'll be in touch soon, okay? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much, Seth. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Yogic Studies podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation and would like to support the show, please consider leaving us a positive review and rating on iTunes. As always, we are grateful for your support. Thanks so much, everyone, and please take care. Mm -hmm.